Okay, so this is Psalms uh, for Beginners. This is lesson number two in that series. And the title of this lesson is Hebrew Poetry. Before we get to the Psalms themselves, you know, there's background material. It's good to understand uh, something about the Psalms, how they were written, uh, so that we'll have a better appreciation when we actually begin studying individual, uh, individual Psalms. So let's do just a, a bit of a uh, review here. The title means praise. The title means praise or praises. Uh, written uh, over, they were written over a period of about a thousand years by several different writers. The earliest um, by Moses, Psalm uh, 90. And the latest uh, uh, 400 BC, Psalm 150. Uh, David, we said, uh, is the most prolific writer of Psalms that we have in the Bible. Approximately 70 of the Psalms in the book of Psalms are credited to uh, David. Originally they were collected in groups or booklets, but eventually put together in the format that we have today. So I mentioned in my first lesson that they circulated. Uh, some of them were by themes or special words or by types, uh, and then eventually collected into the uh, format we have, 150 Psalms five divisions, and uh, these do not include all of the Psalms in the Old Testament. So there are Psalms in various books of the Old Testament, but the most are contained in the book of Psalms, 150. Also said that they were used in the Old Testament as a, uh, a Jewish songbook, uh, sung to uh, the accompaniment of instruments uh, during David's time. Uh, they were also used in synagogue worship. Uh, in synagogue worship, there were no instruments. They, uh, it was uh, strictly a cappella. Uh, used in the early church as a hymn book, again, without instruments. And uh, I said that various versions of our songbooks today, you know, songs of the church or various versions of that have uh, upwards of 125 uh, psalms, songs that are based on, um, on the Psalms. So there's about 125, 126 songs in our songbook based on one or another Psalm. Also, um, I mentioned that Psalms vary, I mean, they're all important books, but Psalms uh, is important in its own way. It's the most quoted book in the Old Testament uh, from the New, in other words, when they quote, you know, when they go and pull quotes from the Old Testament in the New, the book of Psalms is the book where most of the quotes come from in the New Testament. Also, there are many messianic references in the book of Psalms, in other words, prophecies about the coming of the Messiah, and that's exactly what uh, Brother Dayton was talking about, the types, the messianic types of Psalms. Also, Jesus confirmed their inspiration by quoting them himself. And also, uh, just from a poetic perspective, uh, they're universal in nature. They have a timeless appeal. I think we, we, we looked at Psalm 23. You know, the Lord is my shepherd. You can be English or French, you can be German, you can be Polish, you can be Chinese, you can be anything you want. When you read the Lord is my shepherd, you read it in the 18th century or the 12th century or the 21st century, that Psalm speaks to you because of its beauty and its timelessness universal quality. All right, so tonight we're going to move from the history and the authorship of the, of the different Psalms to the poetic style of the Psalms. Very important to understand how they were written in order to be able to grasp the meaning of them. Now, we usually concentrate on you know, the content uh, of the uh, Old Testament but we rarely discuss the style in which the content was produced. So most of the Old Testament is written in poetic form as opposed to uh, a narrative form. And this is in line with what we know about the writings of other ancient civilizations of that era. Uh, lyrical poetry is the earliest example of all literature as is seen by you know, uh, Egyptian writings, uh, Babylonian writers thousands of years before Christ. 
the oldest form of written communication is lyrical. In other words, it's poetry. Long before they were writing, uh, he did this and then he went there and then the next day he tried this and then he killed a cow and he did this and he did that, you know, narrative. Long before that style came out, poetry existed, short snips of, of uh, poetry. Um, in ancient Greece, the poets sang their songs long before the philosophers and historians came on the scene and began to write uh, their books. Among the early Germans and English, the art of poetic composition developed before the art of written prose. The earliest quotations from the Bible, for example, are in poetic form. Uh, Adam's reaction to the creation of woman is, is a poem, right? This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. This is poetry. It's not narrative, right? Uh, God's rebuke uh, to the serpent and Eve and Adam, uh, all that is in poetic form as well. Uh, another example is uh, Lamech. Lamech's boast in Genesis chapter four. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to my voice, you wives of Lamech. Give heed to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me and a boy for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Again, um, poetic, uh, poetic form, and this is early, I mean, Lamech, this is, this is in the, this, these are the ancients here, all right? So when we say poetry versus prose or narration, we mean a style of writing that is distinguished from prose and narration. For example, um, the emotional and imaginative character of its uh, thoughts. In other words, what, what I'm saying here is poetry is distinguished from narration and prose by the emotional and imaginative character of its thought. Uh, uh, poetry has power of imagination and it relies on the emotional impact of its verse to convey its ideas rather than just recounting the story in facts. All right. There's a lot more power in a poem that is written with emotion in mind than simply writing, he went here, he did that, then he went over here and he did that. All right. Another distinguishing factor, poetry uses exalted diction and lofty ideas and noble uh, expressions to convey its message. You know, in poetry, the medium is very important to the message. In other words, in poetry, it's how you say it. It's not just what you say, it's not just the content of what you say, it's how you have expressed it that gives, its, uh, that gives it its power. So many times you use less words, but they're more powerful words than if you're uh, writing prose or narration. Also, poetry is distinguished by its rhythm. Uh, you cannot deliver poetry in a brown paper bag. It's got, it's got a certain rhythm, doesn't it? Hebrew poetry has rhythm of thought rather than the beat of syllables, and I'll explain that a little bit later. In English type poetry, not all English type poetry, but you're looking at the rhythm of it, okay? Like music, like it has a rhythm. But uh, Jewish poetry, Hebrew poetry, doesn't have that kind of, that beat, that certain poetry has, it has a, a rhythm of ideas. Ideas are compared and contrasted. And again, we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, not all Hebrew poetry is contained in the Old Testament. You know, 1 Kings chapter 4, verses 29 to 34 refers to 3,000 proverbs and 1,005 songs of Solomon. Well, there, are, <laughs> there aren't 3,000 Proverbs in the book of Proverbs, right? And there aren't 1,005 songs written by Solomon anywhere in the Bible, and yet the Bible says he produced all of these. And so the Bible only contains some of what Solomon wrote. 
some of the material that he has. A little bit like John, you know, at the end of the Gospel of John, John says if all the things that were written about Jesus or that Jesus did were written in this book, you know, the world couldn't contain all of the books, right? But I have provided these, he says, so that you might believe. Enough for you to have uh, to believe. In the same way, not all psalms, not all songs contained in the Old Testament, but we have some to get an idea, to get a flavor of what is, uh, what is going on. Uh, ancient poetic collections also are referred to. Uh, in Numbers 21:14, the writer talks about the book of wars of the Lord. The book, of, isn't it, you know, is it not written in the book of wars of the Lord? Well, uh, we don't have that book. He refers to the book that exists, but we, it's been lost. You know, we don't know. Um, in another place, in Joshua chapter 10, uh, verse uh, 13, um, it says, we'll pick it up in verse 12. It says, then Joshua spoke to the Lord uh, in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, O sun, stand still at Gibeon, and O moon in the valley of uh, Aijalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation avenged themselves of their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jashar? And then he goes on to say, and the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. So the writer here in the Bible is saying this event where the sun stood still in the sky, it's, it's written about in the book of Jashar. Well, we don't have the book of Jashar. We have this book, but he makes a reference to other material that existed at the time that has been lost to us. So what we do have, however, in the Bible has been collected and presented through the Old Testament of course, under the guidance and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We have 39 books in the Old Testament written mostly in poetic style, as was the custom of writing in the days when this material was first produced. Uh, and you, know, you might be saying, well, why is he taking all this time to tell us about poetry and so on and so forth? Well, if you don't realize that the Old Testament is mostly written in poetry, you're going to have a hard time discerning its meaning. Okay? So not all Hebrew poetry is written in the same style. Most poetry found in the Old Testament can be broken down into two main categories. Number one, nomic. Don't pronounce the G. Nomic, meaning knowledge. This is a type of wisdom poetry. It presents thought and reflection, observations on the human condition, and observation on society. What are the nomic type of you know, books? Well, the book of Job, for example, that's nomic. The book of Proverbs, the book of Ecclesiastes, okay? These are you know, uh, the knowledge books, the wisdom, the books of wisdom uh, in the uh, Old Testament. And also a type, really only two basic types of poetry. Nomic is one, and the other is lyric, lyrical poetry. Uh, comes from the Greek word for the lyre, which was a musical instrument. The difference between nomic and lyrical is that lyrical poetry was originally written to be sung. That's the main difference. All right. These lyric, uh, this type of lyric uh, poetry, very expressive. They're poems that express praise and lamentation and confession. They're about feelings many times. You have very different types of lyric poetry. So you have two main categories, right? Nomic and lyric. And then under lyric, you have a whole bunch of types of lyrical poetry contained in the Old Testament. One of them, of course, the most basic, are the Psalms, praise types of, uh, the types of poetry, mainly about praise. Also lamentations, which means mourning. Again, not only Psalms about 
morning, but other books, the book of Jeremiah, uh, you know, the book of Lamentations, a book of mourning. Uh, um, other types of poetry called uh, lyrical poetry, poems of blessings and curses. For example, Noah in Genesis chapter nine, verse 25 and 26, and Lab Laban and his family, Genesis 24, Laban, you know, they, they talk about uh, the, uh, uh, their sister who is about to be married and there's poetry there. The blessing of Rebecca, you know, may you have you know, many generations. Um, also Moses, uh, blessings and curses in Deuteronomy 33 uh, verses um, uh, one to five. So uh, the, the, uh, the, the blessings and curses, especially Moses, you know, you, he says, uh, this is what's going to happen if you obey God. And he names all the blessings that'll happen. You know, your crops won't fail and your animals will produce and, and, and you, you won't be sick and, uh, and no one will harm you. you know, those are the blessings. But if you disobey, this is what's going to happen to you. you know, you'll grow crops, but you still won't have enough. And the invaders will come on your land and the diseases that the Gentiles have, you'll have these diseases and so on and so forth. You know. So it's, it's poetry, it's not praise, it's not lamentations, it's poetry of blessing and cursing. And usually they come together. Usually they come together. Some blessings and some cursings, okay? Um, I want to show the difference between the King James Version and the New American Standard. You know, the, for, a long, for the longest time, um, scholars believed that the Old Testament was written in the same style as the New Testament. It was just narrative, you know? it was just you know, writing. Um, and I just want to show you the difference here. In Deuteronomy, for example, chapter 33, verses one to five. So this is in the King James Version. Look how it's written. But it says, and, and this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, so this is a blessing, a poetry of blessing. So he said, the Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He, uh, he shined forth from Mount Paran and he came with 10,000s of saints from his right hand, went a fiery law for them. Yea, he loved the people, all of his saints are in thy hand, and they sat down at thy feet, every one shall receive of thy words. Moses commanded us a law, even the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob, and he was king in Jeshurun when the heads of the people and the tribes of Israel were gathered together. So I'm not reading this to make a point about what he's saying here, you know, what, he, what he was promising and what he was blessing. I want you to notice the form. This is the form of this passage in the King James. Now watch, when you go to the New American Standard, look at the difference in the form. Same words, I'm not going to read it over again, but now it's not written like you write a letter. It's not written like a narrative, okay? Now it's written in poetic uh, form, okay? And we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about that. Just hold that thought, I wanted to show you the difference. Because some people are saying, well, uh, what's wrong with the King James Version? Well, there's nothing wrong with the King James Version. The only problem is it was produced before there were modern discoveries about how things were done back in the Old Testament. Okay? All right, so let's keep going with the different types of lyrical poetry. And I'll come back to this in a minute. So other types of lyrical poetry, tribal songs, the Song of Lamech, which I read to you before, you know, uh, you know, 70 times seven, you know, Lamech, that's, that, those are tribal songs. Uh, then there are things called mashals, which are lessons or, or riddles, if you wish, or parables. Uh, Samson's riddle in Judges 14, 14, about the honey, that's a mashal, okay? Um, other types of lyrical paeans, Paeans are songs of victory, okay? Uh, usually something written in reference to some historical event, a victory of some kind, or a great defeat. Uh, Moses at the Red Sea in Exodus chapter 15, verses uh, one to 18, uh, when he talks about the victory, you know, the, the water covering over uh, the Pharaoh and his soldiers, you know, and uh, that's, a, that's called a, a, a paean. Uh, then there are dirges, 
dirges. Dirges are uh, funeral songs. Uh, David's song when Saul and Jonathan were killed in 2 Samuel chapter 1 verses 17 to 27. Uh, David writes a, a very moving uh, poem about how noble Saul was, even though Saul tried to kill him a bunch of times, he still respects his memory that he was a, he was a noble man and, and Israel you know, succeeded when he was there. And of course, Jonathan, Saul's son, who was David's friend, was also killed at that time. So he writes a funeral dirge or song in order uh, to honor these uh, fallen men. So there are, you know, there, there are other types, but those are the seven main types of lyrical poetry that you will find uh, in, the, um, in the Old uh, Testament. And within each book you find different types of, of, of poems, okay? different styles. All right, so there you have the two main categories, nomic, wisdom literature, Lyrical, which is, which is expressive and emotive, and then under lyrical you had those seven different types of poetry that we just talked about briefly. All right, so those are the types. So let's talk about the characteristics, you know, the little things that happen, the little devices within the poem itself that give it a little punch, that give it a, you know, a, 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 uh, that give it, uh, not meaning, but that give it uh, some sort of essence, all right? Um, so the first characteristic of Hebrew poetry is rhythm, rhythm. Most scholars agree that there is rhythm in Hebrew poetry, but not Western style rhythm. I don't mean country and Western here. I mean <laughs> Western civilization type. As I said earlier, the rhythm doesn't follow the number of syllables, but rather the pattern of ideas. So Hebrew poetry was divided into lines and each line was broken into two or more parts called sticks. S-T-I-C-H-S, pronounced stick, like a stick, you know, breaking a stick. So you had a line of poetry and the line was broken into two or more uh, sticks. Usually two or three sticks with several words at each. So here, for example, in Psalm 54, verses one and two, save me, O God, by your name and vindicate me by your power. That's one line, but it's been divided into two sticks. You see that? Hear my prayer, O God, give ear to the words of my mouth. That's a second line divided into two sticks. Now usually there were two or three sticks with several words each. Now they also stressed words in a stick that might have a variable meter indicating where the emphasis should be pronounced. They emphasized words. See, we're so used to Western type poetry or music or lyrics you know, where things rhyme, moon, uh, you know, uh, what's the, a word for moon? Moon, boom. Shine, mine, okay? Uh, Hebrew poetry doesn't work like that. They emphasized words. So it would be, save me, O God, by your name, and vindicate me by your power. Hear my prayer, O God, give ear to the words of my mouth. That was, that was the way that if you were doing orally, they emphasized words, not necessarily words that rhymed with each other, they simply emphasized words to give more power to an oral reading. So you had rhythm, okay? Another device, rhyme. That's easy to talk about rhyme. There was no planned rhyme scheme in Hebrew poetry. That's the big difference between it and much of Western poetry. When there was rhyme, it occurred simply as a coincidence. It was never, it was never planned. So rhythm, rhyme. Now let's look at some devices, little tricks, little things that they did to embellish. That's the word I was looking for before, in order to embellish their poetry, to give it some shine, okay? Um, uh, one of the devices is called assonance. In assonance, assonance, 
similar sounding words that have different meanings. So in Jeremiah chapter one, verse 11 and 12, it says, the word of the Lord came to me saying, what do you see, Jeremiah? And I said, I see a rod, an almond, an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. So you read that in English, it don't mean nothing to you. What do you see? I see an almond tree. And then, and then God says, and I'm watching my word. But in the Hebrew, the word for almond, almond, is shaked, okay? And the word for watching is shoked, shoked. The idea is that the almond tree is the first one to bud in the spring. And so the idea here that Jeremiah is writing about is that God is always the first to see how people are to react to Him and His will. Just like the almond tree is the first one to bloom, God is the first one who is watching, is the first one to see who is responding first to His will. You're saying, wow, <laughs> pretty subtle, right? Pretty subtle. So, uh, uh, and most of the devices that they use are uh, very, very subtle. Um, uh, the point is here is that this similarity between the tree and God's watching is highlighted by the device of assonance, where the two key words sound alike. Okay, almond and watching. All right, another device that is used Acrostic, now we're a little more familiar with this idea because we use this in English poetry as well. Acrostic, where the lines in a poem begin with the succeeding letters of the alphabet. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So you would have, for example, Psalm 25 has 22 verses and it's an acrostic where every line begins with the successive letter in the Hebrew alphabet. So it's as if you had a poem and the first word in an English poem were uh, you know, apples are wonderful in, in June and the second line would begin because we love apples and then the third line uh, would be come and see the apples. You know, as you can see, I'm not much of a poet, but you get the idea. You know? Each line begins with a successive letter of the alphabet. This was a device often used in Hebrew poetry. In Lamentation chapter three, the chapter is a triple acrostic in that it repeats the alphabet three times. It starts at the beginning, does 22 letters, and starts again and does another 22 letters, and then another 22 letters. Again, very subtle, okay? Wait till we get to Psalm 119, you'll see some of the really cool things that the uh, the writers did with that. So uh, uh, we're talking about devices, right? So acrostics were another type of device that they used, again, to embellish their poetry. Another uh, device used, and, and a very important one to understand, is parallelism. The uh, Old Testament scholar Robert Loth, who uh, lived in the 18th century, uh, discovered the use of this device, especially in the Psalms. Loth realized that unlike Western poetry, where rhythm and beat was demonstrated in a poem by stressed words or a rhyme, like I remember a poem from my days when I was in, in Catholic school in Quebec, and we, in Flanders Fields, if you're Canadian, you remember, in Flanders Fields, the poppies grow between the crosses, row on row, and it just goes like that. In, you know, a, a kind of a beat that you recognize, and a, poet, a, a rhyme scheme. It goes, the, the rhyme scheme goes through, all the way through the poem like that, okay? Hebrew poetry had a definite pattern of rhythm, but it was between its ideas and not its words. And this was discovered when Loth discovered the use of parallelism. In other words, by studying and comparing the Psalms, he recognized that the authors purposefully rhymed their ideas, but not their words. 
Further investigation showed that this important poetic device had been abandoned by Hebrew writers after the second century AD. And this is why it hadn't been noticed until Loth rediscovered it in the 18th century. Study by Loth and others managed to catalog six major types of this rhythm of thought, this parallelism, which uh, they uh, named it. Now, it's the most important device in Old Testament lyrical poetry. So let's look at the six different types of parallelism. First, there is synonymous parallelism. Synonymous parallelism is when the author says the same thing but in different words in successive lines. It is the most common form of parallelism. So in uh, Psalm 119 verses one to four, the, the writer says, how blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Isn't that the same thing? If, you're, if your way is blameless and if you walk in the way of the Lord, isn't that kind of the same thing? It's the same idea, but it's presented with different words. He goes on. How blessed are those who observe his testimonies, who seek him with all their heart. Same idea, repeated with different words. They also do no unrighteousness. They walk in his ways. If you walk in God's ways, you're not doing any unrighteousness. Okay, do you see it? You have ordained your precepts that we should keep them diligently. So synonymous parallelism, the repetition of an idea in another line using different words. Okay, another type, antithetic parallelism. Here the second line is a contrast to the first line, not similar, it's contrasted. So in Psalm 30 we read, for his anger is but for a moment, his favor for a lifetime. Contrast, his anger, his favor. Weeping may last for the night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. Okay, weeping at night, joy in the morning. Antithetic, a different concept presented in the, in the next line. All right, another one. Synthetic, synthetic parallelism. The second line does not, um, does not uh, contrast it. You know, it does, it's not the opposite and it's not repeated. It completes, it completes the first. So in Psalm two, then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury. He's going to speak in anger and terrify in his fury. So it's kind of, it, it's not exactly the same, it, it's augmented. It's like it's turning up the heat in the second verse. But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. So I've installed the king. He makes that statement. And then where? Uh, in Zion, where? On my holy mountain. So it, it adds information. Each line adds information. That's synthetic parallelism. Next one is introverted parallelism. The easiest way to realize is to look at the, is to remember Abba, A-B-B-A. -B -A. You have an idea, idea A, and then you have idea B, and idea B is repeated in the third line. So the second and third line are the same, and the first and fourth line are the same. All right, example. My son, if your heart is wise, my own heart will also be glad. And then in verse 16, and my inmost being will rejoice. So you see, the second and third line, B and B, they match. Because the second line is my own heart will uh, be glad and my inmost being will rejoice. So those two lines are the same, the middle lines. And then the fourth line, when your lips speak what is right. That's the fourth line. It's the same as the first line, which is, my son, if your heart is wise. So the first line, my son, if your heart is wise, and the fourth line, when your lips speak what is right. Those two are the same. And then the two middle lines, 
which are, my own heart will also be glad and my inmost being will rejoice. That's A, B, B, A, okay? That's introverted, parallelism. Then you have climactic parallelism. That's stair-like. That's climax, building to a climax. One line picks up words from the previous line and builds and the next line does the same. So in Psalm 93, verse three, it says, and I'll give you the lines. The floods have lifted me up, O, o Lord, one line, one stick, one stick. Uh, the floods have lifted up their voice, second stick. The floods lifted up their pounding waves, third, third stick. So it, climatic, building to a climax, adding material to build to a climax. That is climactic or stair-like. And then there's emblematic, lines that are like or as, uh, that use the words like or as to compare ideas. They're similar to synonymous parallelism. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. You see it? Comparison, when they use as or like to compare. Now, Loth um, recognized a pattern, that was his thing. He recognized there's a pattern here. A lot of these Psalms, you know, they, they work in the same way. So understanding of parallelism helps us better interpret the Psalms because we can know who the author is referring to when he speaks. For example, in Psalm 8 verse 4, famous passage, what is man that you take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him. What kind of parallelism is that? Well, that's synonymous parallelism, isn't it? The son of man here in context refers to, who is the son of man in this poem? Well, it's a man, it's a person. Why do you know that? Because this is parallelism here. The first line, right? The second line just repeats the idea of the first line in a different way. So the first line is, what is man? Well, man, a human being. What is man that you take thought of him? Second line, and the son of man that you care for him. What does the second line refer to? Well, it refers to the thing that's in the first verse. Man, an ordinary man, all right? Now the Hebrew writer takes this particular scripture and in the light of New Testament understanding connects this to Christ. So we get this here in Hebrews in the New Testament. It says, what is man that you remember him? He goes and gets that idea or the son of man that you are concerned about him. Now watch, in the Hebrew writing, he gives some meat to this frame here. He explains what this means. Then he goes on, you have made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You have appointed him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. So, in the Old Testament, the writer was simply referring to a, a man. And he was making the point, who are we human beings that you would actually pay attention to us? We're nothing, we're, we're, we're so weak and sinful, you know, and yet you pay attention to us. You, you worry about us, you give us things. That's the point he's making. The New Testament writer, the Hebrew writer, he goes back and he grabs that passage, brings it into the New Testament, and in the light in the light of revelation of, about who Jesus is, he takes this passage and he makes something more out of it. So he says, who is man? And then he says, or the son of man. Now he's referring to Jesus and we know he's referring to Jesus, okay? Just the way that the poets did this. So let me just summarize, because I heard the first bell. Number one, most ancient writings are in poetic form and so is the Old Testament. Number two, Old Testament poetry is divided into two main categories, nomic, which is wisdom type, and lyric, which is expressive, meant to be sung. Also, it was a style that was helpful for memorization. Isn't that the way we do it? If you ever go into the lower classes where, where our little kids are being taught, how are they remembering things? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and you know, they, they sing it. 
They sing the books of the Bible, they sing the 12 apostles, they sing the kings. Well, nothing new. That's how they, they learned uh, things in the Old Testament as well. And then thirdly, Old Testament poetry has its own particular rhythm and no planned rhyme and it used a variety of devices, assonance, similar sounding words with different meanings, acrostics, using the alphabet, parallelism, a comparison and balancing of thoughts in successive lines and verses. And we said there were different types of parallelism uh, and synonymous parallelism was the main type. All right, so next time we're going to divide the Psalms into the category of themes and we're going to examine individual Psalms that represent well those particular themes. And I mean, there's a reason why I jammed all of the uh, technical stuff about Hebrew poetry into one lesson. I think you'll find it useful as we go on, you're going to start recognizing, oh, oh yeah, that's synonymous parallelism. Oh, that's an acrostic. Uh, it'll be a much more enriching study if you understand some of this technical background here. Okay, that's it for this time. Thank you for your attention.